Joining me now on set to discuss all of this is Peter Baker, chief White House correspondent for The New York Times and an NBC News political analyst, Democratic strategist Juanita Tolliver, and former advisor to Republican House speakers Paul Ryan and John Boehner, Brendan Buck. Thanks to all of you for being here. Really appreciate it. So, Peter, let me start with you and this strategy that we're seeing from the White House digging in. They say they're going to spend these next few weeks while Congress is on recess, essentially finding ways to hammer the bill that just passed in the House in various local markets. Is that a smart strategy, or does it ultimately start to backfire on the president, does he need to invite Speaker McCarthy back? Yeah, that's a good question, because Democrats assume that any government shutdown kind of confrontation, which is a similar thing, a debt ceiling kind of confrontation, works to their benefit, that Republicans end up looking irresponsible, and that's the message that President Biden wants to hammer home. Of course, obviously, he's being irresponsible in Kevin McCarthy's point of view by not coming to the table, and there's a question about whether he, we're playing chicken, right? Mm -hmm. which, eventually, one side is either gonna have to give in or the other in terms of whether we have negotiations or not forget what the actual negotiations would look like. Yeah, Brendan, part of the White House's calculation that Peter's talking about goes back to what they saw in 2011 when you and I, you were working for Speaker Boehner. I was just starting to cover the White House and there was a similar showdown over the debt ceiling. And the White House says, look at the polls back then. A lot of people blamed Republicans. That's what they're basing this strategy on in part. What do you make of that? And, and where does this go from here? Yeah, I don't dispute that they probably do better in the politics of a, a showdown. I, I think that the White House going against House Republicans can probably work out for them. But that doesn't answer the question of how we're going to increase the debt limit, mm -hmm. which is actually a really important thing, obviously. And the bigger political issue is if the economy suffers consequences from a standoff. So they have to have a resolution. I think it's fine for Joe Biden to say that they want a clean debt limit increase. I hope that someone over there appreciates that's not actually going to happen. Mm. At some point, they're going to need to negotiate. Now, yes, there's been debt limit increases many times over many years, but they're very rarely truly clean. They're usually attached to something because debt limits are hard to pass. They are, yeah. they are difficult politically. But you know they, which ones were clean, though? The three under Donald Trump. No, they weren't. That, <laughs> like, that is, no, I, I that is, like... no, that is not true. <laughs> not, not one of them under Donald Trump was clean. They're always attached to something. So this one will be attached to something. They need to come together. It's not going to be a big deal. It's not going to look anything like what happened in the House. Like, mm -hmm. I, we understand that. But they have to have something. They need to come together. And Do Donald, or excuse me, Kevin McCarthy is looking like he's bending over backwards to be reasonable right now. That actually, I think, is working well for him. Does he sound reasonable, though, when, if, let's be real, if Republicans got their way, they wouldn't feed kids who are on SNAP or free and reduced lunch. They wouldn't uh, allow Medicare, ben Medicaid benefits out. They wouldn't, uh, they would lose tens of thousands of teachers and FAA employees. Like, like, none of this seems reasonable in my mind or the American people's mind. And that's why I think the White House is going to lay that out crystal clear so people understand the tactic. Juanita, what about this broader argument, though, that Brendan is making, which is that Okay, the politics of it, Democrats might have the upper hand for now. But let's think about what else happened in 2011. The S&P downgraded exactly. the nation's credit rating, right. even though they did reach a deal. But S&P said the dysfunction has just been too much. And that ultimately hurt former President Obama, did it It not? hurt former President Obama, and President Biden now has PTSD from that. And so mm -hmm. he's trying to stay as far away from that as possible. I think holding firm is giving him a runway to be able to do that. But I agree, there will be some negotiations eventually. But right now, I think the White House position to hold firm makes sense. Peter, what do you make of this idea that ultimately it's going to come down to McConnell mm. to step in and to be the one who figures right. out some type of a deal with President Biden, presumably that allows, I'm told, all sides to declare victory. They tried to do that in 2011 with sequestration. I mean, do we see something similar here? Yeah, it's ironic from the Democrats' point of view, of course, that Mitch McConnell will be seen as the grown-up in the room. But basically, by comparison, yes, he is. And he does have a relationship with President Biden. And during the Obama administration, it was Vice President Biden who was sent over to negotiate with McConnell time and time again to get us out of this fiscal mess or that fiscal confrontation. So he is seen as the key at this moment. He is holding back. He's been very good at the past about picking his timing. Right. When President Trump insists on having a government shut down over his wall funding, McConnell said, fine, you want to do it and see if it works? Let's just wait and see. Mm -hmm. After about five weeks, he says, OK, we've shut, we tried it your way. It didn't work. Let's try it my way. He solves the issue. So we're in that kind of a, I think a, a moment where he may yet come out of the off the sidelines and be the person yeah, to negotiate. But we're not there yet. I'm actually skeptical that that is a, something that could work. I mean, Mitch McConnell, the 
is not very in high regard in the House, let's mm, just say that. At the, all. The politics of that. <laughs> uh, and if Mitch McConnell were to swoop in and just say, well, you know what, I'm going to take care of this, I think Kevin McCarthy would have a very difficult time bringing that bill up. I think he would face a revolt. It's, I think McCarthy has basically put this on his shoulders. He said, I'm going to be the one to negotiate it, and maybe Mitch McConnell will, will have a role in there, but this is on McCarthy at this point. Well, a key test for all of them and the highest stakes game of chicken. I want to talk about another issue that's going to loom large over the 2024 election. That is the issue of abortion, and uh, RNC Chair Ronna McDaniel had something to say about it this weekend. Let's take a listen. Abortion was a big issue in key states like Michigan and Pennsylvania, and so the guidance we're going to give to our candidates is... You have to address this head on. The Democrats spent $360 million on this, and many of our candidates across the board refuse to talk about it, thinking, oh, we can just talk about the economy and ignore this big issue, and, and they can't. Brendan, what do you make of that? She's basically saying we have to talk about, we have to find a way to talk about abortion. Yeah, I understand that, but uh, she didn't really outline how, how to talk about that it, and that, that, that is a problem. Now, look, a lot of Republicans have said you can go on offense on this and make mm -hmm. arguments that Democrats are extreme, that they want abortion in any circumstances, and I think we've tried that a little bit, and maybe there is somewhere, something somewhere there, but I don't, as a party, we clearly haven't figured it out. She's, you know, head of the party and, and couldn't articulate exactly how we're doing it. So, yes, I agree we need to figure out a better strategy, but how to talk about it still seems pretty elusive. Well, on that point, here's how two Republicans talked about it on Sunday. Let's listen. Like many in the pro-life movement, I believe that abortion is a form of murder. Murder, though, is regulated by the states, not by the federal government. I believe in the Constitution. I think Roe was wrongly decided. I've said so for a long time. This is a matter for the states, not the federal government. I would support the restrictions and I would advocate for the exceptions of, of the life of the mother and the cases of rape and incest. I believe that's where the American public is. I don't think anything will come out of Congress without those exceptions. And I certainly would sign a pro-life bill, but I would expect those exceptions to be in place. Peter, two totally different messages. Yeah. You go back to the pre roe being overturned era, and right. Republicans were all largely on the same page. And now it, there's really a vast disparity of viewpoints. How damaging is that? Yeah. Or challenging is that, I think, is the better word. Well, the argument had been let the voters decide, right? Yeah. That's essentially what the Supreme Court said in Dobbs. It belongs to states and the voters not have a national policy. And a lot of Republicans have taken that position for many years. Why are you trying to impose a national abortion policy on us? Now, of course, that the uh, states are allowed to make their decisions, there are some Republicans who are either believe that they ought to have a national policy or feeling pressured to say that they think it should be a national policy. And you're right, there's a contradiction there that they have to explain. They haven't really found a consistent message to your point about what Ronald McDaniel was saying. And, and states are all handling it differently and it, it makes it hard, you know, yeah. when, when one state is saying six weeks and, you know, another state is saying 15, you're being defined by somebody else. And so I understand the, the desire to have some type of national national standard, but it's completely inconsistent with what we've been saying for years. And some of it is politics, that they don't want to have to make the decision themselves. Juanita, how does the White House or the Biden campaign, I should say, capitalize? How do you anticipate they'll capitalize on this? It, all signals point to the vice president being the point person on this issue, on some other key issues like guns, for example. I was going to say they're going to do what they've been doing. They're yeah. going to do what was successful in 2022. They're going to do what was successful in all the ballot initiatives we saw in Kentucky and Kansas and across the country where voters are crossing ideological lines and demographic lines to protect access to reproductive care. So they're going to continue to emphasize this is about freedoms. That was the first word in President Biden's campaign mm -hmm. announcement video. And so that's just the same through line because there's nothing else Republicans can say with that their bans don't already say for them. I want to talk about, as we think about the vice president, a, a lot of Republicans, some Republicans, I should say, are already starting to make 2024, not just a test of President Biden, but also of the vice president and really focusing on the president's age. Let me read you a part of a an op-ed by Nikki Haley, who wrote uh, today, I wish Joe Biden the best of health, but it's only sensible to consider the reality of an already slipping president serving through his mid-80s. If Biden is reelected, Harris would have the highest likelihood of becoming president in the middle of a term of any vice president ever. The question before voters in 2024 is, to an unprecedented degree, whether they want Kamala Harris to be president, not vice president. Juanita, what do you make of that strategy? And given that her poll numbers are lower than President Biden's, how vulnerable are they? 
Look, I think this is going to be something we're going to hear a lot more of as the question about age permeates this entire election cycle. But I'm always going to start with one, President Biden and former President Trump are only three and a half years apart. So if you're going to say this about him, it has to be said about Trump as well. And two, the reality is that this is going to be a choice election and voters know what they get with someone like Trump. Violence at the Capitol, efforts to overturn elections, alliances with authoritarian regimes like Putin, right? Like versus President Biden, who has delivered on multiple issues and legislation for voters. So, Brendan, what do you make of what we heard from Nikki Haley. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's in good taste, but it's probably true. And, and I think it's on a lot of voters' minds. And we've seen a lot of polling that the president's age is, is a factor. I think the problem for Nikki Haley is she's not really taking on the person. It's fine to run against Joe Biden if you want, but you got to become the nominee. And she's not really doing anything to take on mm. Donald Trump or even Ron DeSantis at this point. So as many Republicans keep running against Joe Biden, it probably makes them feel good and it's a good place for them to be. But I think a lot of them need to start thinking about how they're actually going to become the nominee and take on Donald Trump a little more. But I right? think it does that underscore, though, it does underscore the Democrats conundrum with Kamala Harris. I don't make too many Democrats who are super happy with her right now. Not that they think that they can get rid of her off the ticket. They, they, sometimes they think the criticism of her is unfair. But there's a lot of Democrats who worry that she does not has not yet risen to the occasion and want to make her stronger. So she's not a vulnerability in 2024. And the, the path to doing that is harder to see. All right. Great conversation, you guys. We covered a lot of ground on this busy Monday. Thank you, Peter, Juanita, and Brendan. Great stuff. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.